Hi, I'm Ron Matson, and welcome to Learn the Bible in 24 Hours with Dr. Chuck Missler. Chuck will be taking you through some interesting oversights of the Bible and showing you some amazing facts. For more information on how you can join this group, click here. Well, we are in hour 17 of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, and we're going to focus this session on the book of Acts, and I'll call it, with my tongue in my cheek a little bit, Luke Volume 2. Luke wrote two books, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, which follows naturally in many ways from his uh, 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 gospel. The New Testament, of course, has five historical books opening the New Testament. The Old Testament had five books of Moses, which opened its structure. And the New Testament has five five, uh, narrative books, the four Gospels and the book of Acts. And again, I say the book of Acts really serves as Luke volume 2 in a sense. And that's followed by epistles, which are the interpretive uh, sessions, and we'll get to those of course later, and climaxing with the book of Revelation, which wraps up the whole Bible in a comprehensive way. But the book of Acts is our uh, focus tonight. Sometimes in some of your Bibles called the, the Acts of the Apostles. Well, if that was true, it's a little puzzling because you've, uh, you've only, you got primarily Peter and Paul in the, t- the first half of the book, of major section of the book being Peter and the second section being Paul. But it could be more properly titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit because there's much more going on than just Peter and Paul with Philip and some other things. But... Uh, You may recall as we looked at the design of the four Gospels, we recognized that each of the four main writers had a specific theme, a specific focus, a specific approach. Matthew presenting Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel, a very Jewish perspective, starting his genealogy with Abraham and going right on through, finishing with the resurrection, which is a very, again, a very Jewish focus of attention. Mark, who is really Peter's Uh, secretary, wrote emphasizing his servanthood. And uh, he focused on what Jesus, not what he said, but what he did. It's almost like a shooting script if you study it carefully. But it finishes with uh, the ascension. Luke, being a doctor, focuses on Christ's humanity, the Son of Man. And uh, his genealogy starts with Adam and goes right on through, through Mary. We covered all of that. And uh, he closes his gospel with the promise of the Holy Spirit, how that when Jesus would leave, the the Comforter would come. And as you realize, what that really does, it deliberately sets up the book of Acts. And and, uh, John, as the fourth gospel, focuses not on what Jesus said or what he did or what he felt, but who he was and uh, the Son of God. And he finishes his gospel with the promise of Christ's return, which is interesting because he sets up his gospel in a sense. Uh, he sets up his sequel, the book of Revelation, of the return of Christ. So, so again, John focuses on who Jesus was and uh, a Luke on the uh, Holy Spirit, which of course sets up the book of Acts. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, but the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So this is a pre-announcement, anticipative announcement in the upper room. And uh, he continues a a couple chapters later, he also amplifies his mission. Jesus says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So here again, Jesus is doing several things. He's announcing the primary mission of the Holy Spirit. Don't be confused by this. The Holy Spirit's very active all through the Scripture. The first quotes of God involve the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God moved or brooded above the, uh, above the waters in Genesis, in the first chapter, in the second verse of the first chapter. So the Holy Spirit's very active, but he is he comes in a very special way uh, 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 to accomplish these things. And uh, he will guide you into all truth. 
He shall not speak of himself. You know, it's fascinating to notice throughout the Bible, whenever there's a type or a model, like Abraham being the father and Isaac being the son, the son being offered and so forth, it's always interesting that the Holy Spirit is always in the role of an unnamed servant. In Genesis 24, where Abraham commissions his, uh, his uh, business partner uh, to go and get a bride for Isaac. Again, we have Abraham in the role of the father. We have this guy, unnamed there, but if, if you go uh, uh, several chapters earlier, you'll find out his name is Eliezer, which means comforter. But it's interesting, he's always an unnamed servant. In the book of Ruth, when uh, 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 Ruth is introduced to Boaz. Ruth is uh, the gen- going to be the Gentile bride of the kinsman redeemer, Boaz. Who introduces Ruth to Boaz? An unnamed servant. It's fascinating to notice the Holy Spirit, when he's in a typological model of some kind, it's always an unnamed servant. And uh, why? Because of John 16, 13. He shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that, sh- hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. That's also a pre- endorsement of the New Testament, which will come out of all of this. And uh, it's interesting how in John 16, Jesus emphasizes the apparent mutually exclusiveness in some sense. Um, For this next phase, Jesus is announcing, of course, in the upper room, John 14 through 16 being that, in fact, through 17 of the upper room discourse, he says, it is expedient for you, speaking as disciples, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now we can't pretend to really understand the dynamics here, except it's clear that there's some kind of exchange going on. Jesus would leave in order for the, to make it possible for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell among us. So there's a concept here of locality. When Jesus was on the earth in his ministry, he had locality. You could touch and feel him. He was in a, a specific location geophysically. And uh, uh, it's interesting that by his going away and the Holy Spirit coming, the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at one time, among all of us, not in just one, one place. So it's interesting to see the, uh, uh, the, the differences there. But um, So the acts of the Holy Spirit will involve a number of things. We've got um, the ascension, We'll see Pentecost, which as we would call it, or the Feast of Shavuot, the birth of the church, major feature. The outrage against Stephen will occur. Philip and the Ethiopian treasure, we'll talk about that because most people don't know the background there. Uh, The call of Saul, if you will, or Paul. And uh, we've got 28 thrilling chapters here that are going to include all things. Peter's vision uh, at Cornelius is introduced. Here's a Jewish apostle introduced to the Gentile world by a centurion, or a vision through the centurion, and uh, which of course opens the mission to the Gentiles. And then this very interesting council in Jerusalem. And um, they're, they're, this whole book, it's, it's a shame we have to survey it so superficially, because it's full of intrigues, violent mobs, blood oath alliances, people, group of 40 guys swearing to the death to kill Paul. These guys were, took what they were doing very seriously on both sides. And uh, all kinds of corrupt officials and so forth, jailbreaks, shipwrecks, magicians, sorcerers, um, raising from the dead, all, all these things are going on. A very uh, interesting book, a very dynamic, uh, uh, dramatic book. Um, but it's also a very key book. It's the bridge, if you will, from the history to the interpretive epistles. It's the gateway to the epistles. And it also uh, highlights the major turning point of world history. And uh, we'll have the first missionary journey that uh, Paul takes on to, the Gal- to Galatia. Um, the second missionary journey, which will go to Greece and start to open up Europe. And uh, then the uh, third missionary journey where he reviews all of that. And we'll find uh, these outcries against this incredible human being that we call Paul. Before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish uh, uh, officials, before the governor Felix, before Festus, before King Agrippa, and ultimately appealing to the, wor- the leader of the world, Caesar himself. And so Acts will conclude about that time, and when he goes to Rome. And we'll talk some of the interesting things about the shipwreck. And that was not the only shipwreck, by the way. It's probably the fourth shipwreck that he had, but he was, um, he was probably bad news for a ship captain. If Paul's aboard, you know, oh, anyway, uh, I'm kidding. Um, Acts chapter 1, 
really deals with the departure of Jesus Christ. It d- deals with the ascension. The Gospels take you up to this, but this, is, this really records the, uh, the post-resurrection instructions and where they are instructed to await the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, it of course, records the ascension from Mount of Olives, where a cloud comes down and receives Him. And there's two angels. It's interesting how these angels always seem to be in pairs. There's a pair of angels that destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a pair of angels uh, 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 up here at the ascension and so forth. Two angels confirm that He will return just like He left. And uh, in like manner is the phrase in your English Bible. And uh, this is also described in Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. There's a great deal of visibility In fact, there's seven times as many verses about the second coming of Jesus Christ as there are with the first. And so uh, uh, it's a very, very major part of Scripture. But now they have, of course, 11 in the the key group, the inside group, are uh, 11 uh, 11, because Judas is history. (laughs) And uh, there are about 120 present at the meeting. But the, the, the inside 11, uh, the, uh, they decide to cast lots to elect a replacement for Judas. And the lots are cast, and a guy by the name of Matthias is selected. And this leads to uh, some disputes among scholars. There are many that believe that that was probably a mistake. It was a self-appointed task they took on for themselves. Uh, many feel that the, le- the 12th apostle would be Paul. Paul would be the natural replacement. There are many Bible teachers that emphasize that, and they may be correct. However, there are other scholars which point out that the apostles were Jewish and primarily ministered to Israel. That Paul's distinctive role was to be called as the uh, 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 apostle to the Gentiles. The door to the Gentiles will be opened by Peter, an incident with Peter in, in, in chapter 10, but the real, clearly, uh, uh, the, the clear mandate uh, for uh, uh, the Gentile world was Paul. So whether the twelve really were, you know, there, there's a lot of debate as to just, you know, was Matthias really the legitimate uh, choice or not, and, and not a big deal, but you'll find different, different scholars have slightly different views. But one of the key verses in the first chapter of the book of Acts is uh, the ma- marching orders where, God, where Jesus says to them, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, which of course will occur in the following chapter, in chapter 2. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now what's interesting about this is there's a, there's a sequence here Jerusalem being the local scene that they're at right now. Then all Judea. Visualize that as a a larger ring. All Judea. Then extending that even further is Samaria, which is sort of the half-Jewish area. Samaria, Samaritans being looked at as as only ethnically impure in that sense. And then, of course, fourthly, the uttermost parts of the earth. There are many ministries that look at this as their growth charter. First you, bl- you bloom where you're planted, where you start, then as you grow you take the next neighborhood, then you grow, and, and finally to all, in all the earth. And uh, so, but clearly in Acts chapter 2 we have the big event, the Holy Spirit descends in a very visible way at the Feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. Um, and it, it's, very, it's a very interesting, ver- it's a very overlooked feast. Of the seven feasts of Moses, there were three that were required attendance of every able-bodied Jew in Jerusalem, if he could do it. And uh, the Passover, actually it's the Feast of Unleavened Bed, but generically the Passover season is one of them. The Feast of Tabernacles at the end, and there's a strange one in between, the Feast of Shavuot. And it's the only one that has leavened bread involved. It's a very peculiar, it's, it's obviously a, 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 a predictive feast of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's fulfilled on that very day. And uh, as they, as, they, as they meet, the Holy Spirit visibly descends like flames of fire, and uh, everybody, all the people there from all over the world, uh, hears them speak in their own tongues. And uh, they, they're really quite disturbed. Something very supernatural is going on, and Peter explains it by quoting from Joel chapter 2. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the birth of the church. 
This is where the mystical church begins. This is one of the distinctions you need to emphasize in your own Bible studies to recognize that not all people that are saved are necessarily in the same category. There are people saved all through the Old Testament, obviously, and there are also people that are saved during the period we live in today. But there are some very important distinctives between those two, and there's going to be again a third group in effect, those that are uh, saved after the church is gathered. You need to understand as you study ecclesiology, the study of this peculiar mystical thing we call glibly the church. And we're obviously not talking about the physical edifices of churches, we're talking about the, the, this, this very privileged assembly that you and I are part of if you're, we're in Christ. We enjoy privileges and blessings that are unique to us that were not available to the people in the Old Testament. Very distinct. And that's what Paul tries to get across in his epistles. We often don't understand his answers because we don't understand the questions he's dealing with. And so be sensitive to that in any case. Israel and the church are not the same thing. They're both distinctive. They have different origins, different missions, different destinies. You need to understand that. Check it out. Well, we won't go through each of the chapters, the 20 chapters in Acts, but there, chapter 7 of Acts is an incredibly interesting, instructive chapter. It's basically this young kid, Stephen, is before the Sanhedrin, the most august body in the Judaism. And uh, he gives, this kid gives these elders a history lesson. In his speech, he reviews the history of Israel. This is interesting for several reasons. Let me give you two. One is, he mentions things in his speech. He makes comments, in effect, about the Old Testament that you will not find in the Old Testament. There are insights here that are unique to this chapter. That he, un- he unravels a few riddles for us by his perspective. The other reason it's interesting is to figure out where he's headed. They do not let him finish his speech. Before he's finished, they take him out and stone him to death. It's interesting to study his speech, outline it for yourself on a piece of paper sometime, and see where he was headed. And I'll give you a few clues. First of all, there's a place where he talks about the Pharaoh that, uh, of the Exodus. He mentions how Joseph is down there and in and, 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 and charge and all that. But then another Pharaoh that knew not Joseph rises. Now in the English, when we say another, we just mean another. In the Greek, they have two different words. If I want one of you to give me another pencil exactly like the one I have. I just broke it. I want another one like the one I've got. You see, I would use the word alos for another. If I really want a different kind of pencil, I've got a red one, I want a blue one or something, then I would use the word heteros, a different kind. It's like saying another of a different kind. The first one is another of the same kind. What's provocative in the Greek of Stephen's uh, uh, discussion of Pharaoh, he uses the word heteros, which means the Pharaoh that succeeded the Pharaoh that was favorable to Joseph was a totally different kind of guy. And that puts us on the alert when you get to, it turns out that the Pharaoh that, uh, of the Exodus was not Egyptian. He was an Assyrian. You will not find this, I don't believe, in any study of Egyptology. Because they all presume, they, they make presumptions. There are some schol- the recent scholars that are, have just shredded the traditional um, uh, uh, chronology of, 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 of the Egyptian pharaohs. You discover if you get into this, start studying it, all the you know, 25th dynasty or whatever, these are scholastic labels. They were not necessarily clear from the, the dynasties of the time. They're, they're, they're retrospective scholastic categories. And there are some studies now that have show that if you put, if you analyze what we think we know about the pharaohs carefully, they do fit astonishingly with the Bible. And one of the embarrassing things, if you've done biblical studies in the past, the, 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 the Egyptian lineup chronologies and the biblical chronologies don't seem to mesh at all. Well, that's because of poor scholarship of the past. Some, there's some very radical studies that are, are kicking that hand, if you will. But Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 tells us that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Assyrian. Pharaoh was a title. He wasn't always Egyptian. A very important Pharaoh we're going to talk about uh, when we get to Acts chapter 8 is, uh, uh, we'll we'll get into that there. But something else, we also discover in the first few verses of, of Stephen's talk, we discover that Abraham 
didn't obey God the first time. God had said to Abraham, get you out of the, or the Chaldees. And so if you read Genesis carefully, the allusion there is something God had said earlier. He's supposed to leave his family. He didn't. He just moved up a river. And uh, that, that uh, is another fascinating aspect to Abraham's life that emerges out of Stephen's summary here. But something else, a larger overview, what Stephen's really highlighting as you study his talk is that Israel's history has always been a pattern of failures. Abraham didn't obey God initially. He finally, when his father dies, then he does obey. He had been told to leave. It was a second time, so to speak, that he does it right. Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Um, And uh, again, there's a double uh, 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 identity time there, before he's uh, 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 exalted. Uh, Moses uh, was rejected by Israel at first when he killed the Egyptian. It was the second time that they accepted his leadership. The law, the first Ten Commandments were destroyed. God had to make a second set of them. And you'll always, all through their history, when they get to Kadesh Barnea, they don't accept the, spot, you know, the, 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 the challenge to go forward, so they're condemned, so to speak, into uh, spending 40 years wandering in the wilderness. It's the second time that they finally go through under Joshua and so forth. His pattern is that they always blow it the first time they make it on the second. And this builds right up to the point he's talking about your Messiah came and you've crucified him. What's his point? He's coming back. See, there's a second. Again, it's, it follows the pattern that they'll, the second time he comes, they'll accept him and uh, so forth. So you can go through that on your own studies. There are some interesting parallels. The first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, uh, Jerusalem is at the center. Peter is the chief figure in the first 12 verses, uh, 12 chapters. It reaches as far as out, the, the outreach of the gospel goes out as far as Samaria. The word is rejected by the Jews of the homeland in Israel. Peter is imprisoned. There's a judgment on Herod. In, con- in chapter 13 and following, you'll, know, you'll discover that the center of the action is no longer Jerusalem, it's Antioch is at the center of the, of the Gentile outreach. Peter's no longer the chief figure. We don't hear much about him after that, occasionally. Paul is the chief player in the, in the last half of the book. The reach outreach here goes all the way to Rome. And the word is rejected now by the Jews of the dispersion. Paul is imprisoned, not Peter, and there's the judgment on the Jews. So interesting parallels. There's another way to parallel the book of Acts as you go through it. Peter, his first, ser- first sermon is Acts chapter 2. He, lame man is healed in chapter 3. Simon the sorcerer is dealt with in chapter 8. The influence of his shadow it heals people in chapter 5, strangely enough. Laying on of hands. Uh, Peter's worshipped, actually. He rejects it, of course, but they try to worship him in, cha- in chapter 10. Tabitha is raised from the dead. Peter's in prison in chapter 12. From chapter t- after chapter 12, Paul is the key player. The first sermon is there in chapter 13. A lame man is healed. Elamus, the sorcery, is, uh, is a, 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 the key thing in chapter 13. Again, we have these strange influences of handkerchiefs and laying on of hands emphasized. Paul is even worshipped in chapter 14, or they try to. Antiochus uh, falls out of a third story window, but he's raised from the dead in chapter 20. Paul in prison. Not a big deal, but there's some interesting parallels here in structure that I think is uh, probably deliberate, or is certainly, uh, I think, an intentional design. But let's take a look at it. Uh, let's take another look at it uh, geographically. Let's talk about Philip. Um, he's one of the, after the stoning of Stephen, uh, the believers in Jerusalem were scattered, and uh, Philip was one of the seven helpers or deacons, if you will, of the early church. And he goes to Samaria, and many people are healed uh, in Samaria. And uh, it's up north. It's a, a marginal country from a Jewish perspective, and uh, it's up there that Simon the uh, magician comes to faith. Down in Jerusalem, there are several, namely Peter and John, are surprised that the Samaritans are accepting Jesus. They're excited about that. They go up to check it out. And they do and find, they do and find that these Samaritans are very enthusiastically accepting Christ. But they also recognize this guy Simon, who was a magician, apparently of some repute at the time, who became a believer. Um, they had to admonish him because he, uh, he offered them money for the Holy Spirit. By the way, Peter and John do investigate and, get, and they, get good return, they get good news, although they did, have, they did admonish Simon. But now, right in the middle of this um, 
revival, so to speak, uh, Philip is sent by God down to the Jerusalem to Gaza road. There's a road from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And Philip is pulled out of this revival and sent down there to meet, of all people, an Ethiopian treasurer. Uh, he is on his way home confused. He apparently has gone to Jerusalem to worship the Messiah. Apparently finds out he's been killed, whatever, he's confused. He's on his way home now confused. And we have this interesting incident where Philip approaches him and says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless somebody helps me? And it turns out he's reading from Isaiah 53, and I'm going to suggest 52 and 53 for some reasons. There are, to, to really understand what's going on here, you should be acquaint yourself with some of the theories about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared sometime after the Babylonian captivity. It seems to have disappeared from uh, history. There are about six different theories as to what happened and where it is. They're all conjectural. But the most interesting one is one that has been disregarded by many scholars because it, it's accompanied with some non-biblical legends. Um, to look at history here a little bit, see, well, let me back up. We're going to talk about is it possible that the Ark of the Covenant could be down in Ethiopia? And uh, most people reject that the, the, the Ethiopians believe that they're guarding a relic that they are destined to present to the Messiah on Mount Zion. And that's guarded as, to the present day in a, in a special compound in, in Axum. They believe the way it got there is a way that you can dispute biblically, and so most people dismiss the fact that what they have is really the ark. What they overlook is they may have the relic by a path that they didn't understand. They have a different legend they believe, and I won't go into that here. We do know from 2 Kings 21 that Manasseh, who took over after Hezekiah, tried to destroy Judaism. He made reading the Torah, uh, he tried to destroy all copies of the Torah. Reading it was a capital crime. He tried to destroy Judaism from end to end. During that time, the Levites, to protect the Ark of the Covenant, got it out of the temple, out of town, out of the country. When you get down, uh, uh, when you, uh, and apparently they sought protection under Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. After Manasseh comes Josiah, a young guy who discovers an overlooked copy of the Torah, reads it, and realizes how, realize how far they've fallen. So he institutes a whole revival, and he instructs the Levites to return the ark to Israel, in fact, to the temple, to the Holy of Holies. It doesn't say they complied. He just asserts that they should. A few verses later, this is all in 2 Chronicles 35, a few verses later, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt is taking up arms against the Assyrian Empire, which apparently is decaying and it's going to fall in a few more years. Um, Josiah takes up arms against Pharaoh Necho. That puzzles any reader, but it also puzzles Pharaoh Necho. He says, what are you doing? I'm doing what God told me to do. What most people don't realize is that Pharaoh Necho was an Ethiopian. He was the 25th, what's called the Ethiopian dynasty. Well, he, uh, Josiah goes against him anyway and gets killed. But from that point on, there is a traceable record of a relic of some kind. The tabernacle was set up on Elephantine Island, which, is, which, which at that time was the capital of Egypt, in the middle of the Nile, at the border of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, and for two centuries, the tabernacle was there. The ark is transferred from Elephantine Island to, a, to Tanakirkus Island, which is a, on Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and it stays there for eight centuries. In fact, uh, from about the... Uh, uh, anyway, it, it, there are even records in the Ethiopian Bible of Joseph and Mary and the infant, Jesus, visiting Tanakirkus Island um, at, uh, at, uh, when they were down there taking refuge from, from Herod. But anyway, they, after eight centuries of Tanakirkus Island, it's transferred to Axum where it, stay, where it is today. So from about 642 B.C., Elephantine Island, Egypt. At 420 B.C., it tra transfers to Tanakirkus Island in Ethiopia. And uh, it's destined, and, it's, and now it's at Axum, and it's destined to be presented to the Messiah on Mount Zion, according to Isaiah 18 and Zephaniah 310 and other passages. Now, we don't know if the relic they're guarding is the Ark of the Covenant, but the more we've studied, the more it looks like it could very well be, and there, there's, a, there's a whole story behind that. I encourage you to dig out on your own and come to your own conclusions. But the question was, why was the Ethiopian treasurer on a mission? 
And uh, uh, it's our conjecture that he was there to check out, is it time to deliver the Ark of the Covenant to the Messiah? He gets to Jerusalem, discovers the Messiah is apparently killed. He's confused. On his way home, Philip was supernaturally dispatched to explain to him Isaiah 53, which essentially says that the Messiah is destined to return. So I think he went back to Queen Candace and said, not yet. And they've been guarding it ever since. Uh, it moved from Tanakirkus Island to Lake Ta- to uh, Aksum, e- Ethiopia in, in uh, uh, 330 AD, and uh, they celebrate it every year. They don't actually bring it out, they bring out a ceremonial relic for ceremonial purposes. It's interesting to see, it's interesting to stand on an island, stand on a hill, surrounded by tens of thousands of Levites in white sheets, singing and praying ecstatically, round the clock for two days prior and during the two days of Timcat, celebrating, get this, the baptism of Jesus Christ. They have a ceremony that goes down to the water and comes back, takes two days. It's um, um, very colorful, very interesting, but uh, try, to compute, try to integrate that. Tens of thousands of Levites celebrating the baptism of Christ. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, moving on. So uh, anyway, the, the Ethiopian treasurer encounters Philip. He interprets the scripture for him. He says, Jesus, there's some water. Can I, there, here's some water. Can I not be baptized? Certainly can. So he baptized him, and he goes on to report to Queen Candace. So uh, Peter, meanwhile, travels north, preaching in every town. Um, Peter settles in Caesarea with wife and daughter. And uh, Stephen is martyred in the Jerusalem. And uh, after he's martyred, believers are scattered throughout the world. And uh, some travel up to Antioch. Now I want to warn you, there are two Antiochs. The main one is the one we're looking at here. The Antioch, we could call it the Antioch of Syria. There's another one we're going to encounter up in Galatia that's less important. This is the Antioch that's important. It becomes the strategic center of the Gentile outreach of the church. And uh, so uh, in chapter 11 they travel to Antioch and, and uh, they initially preach to Jews only. But some of these come from Cyprus, some from North Africa, and they preach to Gentiles. So this is the beginning of the Gentile conversions. Now the Jerusalem church sends Barnabas, a trusted leader, to find out what's going on up in Antioch. And when he gets up there, he collects Saul from Tarsus. He had spent some time in Tarsus, um, and uh, uh, they stay to teach uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, several years. Now, um, the, it's this, the strength of the church in Antioch that raises money to uh, assist, to relieve the uh, church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is technically, James is the head of it, and they're sort of the leaders. At the same time, they're poor. They have financial needs. Antioch is stronger and sends relief money there. There's many records there of where Paul encourages them to, to send money to the, to the church in Jerusalem. And uh, they also, from Antioch, they, not only do they support the church in Jerusalem financially, but they also send missionaries uh, to foreign countries. So it becomes a major, major center for the last half of the book of Acts, for sure. Very cosmopolitan countries. It's one of the most important uh, uh, cities in the Roman Empire. And it's interesting to see the cross-section of these cosmopolitan people that God is using. Barnabas was a Jew from Cyprus. Simeon, also called uh, Simeon the Black, probably from Africa thus. Uh, Lucius was a Cyrene from North African city. Manane was a, uh, a foster brother to Herod Antipas, obviously of, of influence. And uh, we have this interesting character by the name of Saul, who was a Jew from Roman Tarsus. He later would become Paul the Apostle. Interesting cross-section of people. And uh, just like you and me, all different kinds. Well, let's shift now. We talked about Philip. Let's talk about the Acts of Peter. On Pentecost, he preaches, of course, and many become believers. Uh, he heals a lame man. He's arrested with John and, and warned not to preach, but of course that does no good. <laughs> Peter and John follow Philip into Samaria, and many believe there. I've mentioned that before. Peter then goes to Lydia and Joppa to raise Dorcas from death. And miracles going a long way. Then we get into this interesting issue with Cornelius. He's a centurion. You know, it's interesting in the book of Acts and in the Gospel of Luke, centurions are always good guys. It's very fascinating. You'll also notice when you read Luke and Acts is that there's always an emphasis there that the uprisings, the trouble, was always the Jewish leadership reacting to the Christians. And uh, it's, uh, uh, all through the book of Acts, the, the, the persecution didn't come from the Romans. It came from the Jewish leadership. 
The Roman oppression came later, and Nero and much later. But in any case, here we have Cornelius. He has a vision in Caesarea. That's where he's based. That's the, that's the, major, the major headquarters for the Roman activity was Caesarea, not Jerusalem. They were in Jerusalem only for holidays. The pilot was in Jerusalem during Passover because it was a holiday. Normally he would have his, his headquarters was in Caesarea. Anyway, um, so he has a vision and he sends for Peter who's down in Joppa. Well, while this is going on, Peter down in Joppa has a vision. And, he's, and he, so he goes to Caesarea. And this is where we have this strange vision where this sheet comes down with all the non-kosher food in it. And rise and eat. And he wouldn't eat because it was Jewish. This is non-kosher stuff. And he says, don't, you know, don't, uh, what, don't condemn what I have blessed. So it, 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 that happens three times. The, the, the message it gets across to Peter is that, uh, that uh, all things are lawful. And it's a whole different, uh, it, it's, it's really opening the door uh, to the Gentile believers. Major thing in Acts 10. So he re- Peter reports to the Jerusalem church who, who accept because of all this, they accept the fact that the gospel is for Gentiles also, not just Jews. And uh, this starts, this leads to a whole other set of issues that are going to come to head in chapter 15 of Acts. But at this point, there are Gentiles that are accepting Christ and becoming what you and I would consider what we would call Christians. Peter's arrested and he's miraculously released and so forth. There's many of these episodes going. And he ultimately will testify at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And uh, we'll get there. The rest of Peter's work, we don't know much about. We know that he meets Paul in Antioch. And uh, he also visits churches in North Asia Minor. We hear allusions to that. There's evidence that he was in Corinth at one time. He wrote his first letter. First Peter was written from Babylon. Now it's very interesting. Uh, there are many people that believe that Babylon is a code for the book for the city of Rome. That's utter f- foolishness. Um, Babylon was a major Jewish center. He wrote he, he wrote the, his first epistle from Babylon. The Babylonian Talmud came from Babylon. Babylon in those days was a major Jewish center. It was no longer a dominant imperial town like it had centuries earlier, but it's still there with, as a major center. So, um, as a, as, and we'll go on. Peter was executed in Rome just as the Lord had predicted. And Mark wrote his gospel in Rome just after Peter's death. The, he, he, he acts somewhat as a, as a secretary, an amanuensis for Peter. So when you read the gospel of Mark, it's really, a, it's really almost Peter's perspective. Peter was a guy of action, not words. And uh, Mark's gospel is like a shooting script. It includes details. When they sit on the grass, it's green grass, etc. If you watch, it's a very brief, tight little gospel. Actually, it'd be longer than Matthew if, you, if, you, if Matthew hadn't included all the discourses. Matthew included the discourses because he took shorthand. But uh, let's get to pick up this Damascus Road event. Very, very important thing. Saul, he spent his early years in Tarsus. He was a, a born a Roman citizen, raised in Tarsus. Tarsus was a very important Roman city. And uh, it was also the seat of a uh, famous university, higher in reputation than any of the other universities, even Athens or Alexandria, uh, were the only other ones that existed. But Tarsus was a, was a top uh, uh, you know, intellectual center. He was taken to Jerusalem as a young boy and educated by, of all people, Gamaliel himself. Gamaliel is probably the most venerated you know, Jewish teacher at that time. So he became a Pharisee, very well taught in both Greek culture and uh, Hebrew culture. And of course when Stephen is stoned uh, to death for his faith, Saul's the guy holding the coats of the guys throwing the stones. And he becomes a violent persecutor of the church. And uh, he's given uh, letters of authority to imprison Christians. And he even travels to foreign cities to root them out. So this is, uh, 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 this is Saul. So he's, he's uh, as I say, educated in Jerusalem and so forth. And uh, now he's on the road to Damascus on the way there. And he's confronted by guess who? Jesus Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, uh, for, and, the, and he's also, he's told then to go when he gets to Damascus to check out with this guy Ananias. Ananias and uh, he's blinded in the meantime. And uh, when he gets to Ananias, his blindness is healed. And he's baptized there as a Christian. Now this also leads to some speculation. We do know that Paul had some medical afflictions. 
We also have hints in his letters that they had something to do with his eyes. So even though his blindness was healed, he apparently did suffer some ocul uh, uh, ocular optical impairment here. Or, and, and apparently it was un very uh, non-cosmetic. And uh, those are, so we don't know that much, much more than that. But in any case, he has this incredible experience where he now is uh, uh, called by the Lord Jesus Christ to serve him. He stays in Damascus. While there, he, uh, during the Damascus period, he also spends about three years in the Arabian desert and then returns to Damascus. And uh, so he's, uh, he's uh, uh, during that time, he apparently is instructed uh, directly by the Holy Spirit and so forth. Now, he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. So three years after his conversion, he is now forced to flee Damascus in a basket. They lower him over a basket over the wall to, to get him out of town. That's a pattern he's going <laughs> to endure a lot in his life, I guess. He goes to see Peter, and Barnabas uh, introduces Paul to these suspicious believers. You've got to understand the prediction of the predicament of the believers in those days. Here's this zealot that has been persecuting He's now coming and posing as a Christian. They think he's just a, it's just a ruse to get their names before they you know, get imprisoned or something. So they had to overcome that uh, paranoia, if you will. And uh, uh, Barnabas uh, uh, you know, helps him with that. He talks with Peter and James, and after two weeks he's smuggled out of Jerusalem, but with the blessing, if you will, of uh, Peter and James. And uh, he's taken to Caesarea and then to Tarsus. And he'll be in Tarsus about ten years before Barnabas comes and uh, recruits him to come to Antioch where all the action is. In the meantime, Paul had uh, 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 visited Cilicia and Syria and some places, but he's still relatively unknown to believers in Judea. He's doing most of this up there uh, north of Syria in a region that would be associated with Asia Minor. And uh, Barnabas finally recruits him and brings him to Antioch because that's where all the action is. And they teach together for a year. They become good buddies. They all have a dispute that splits them up. Um, meanwhile, Saul, Barnabas, and Titus bring famine relief money for Judea. See, again, the churches up north are helping to support the believers down in, uh, in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And, they, and so, uh, anyway, uh, they, the leadership meets privately and they uh, acknowledge Saul's ministry uh, to the Gentiles. Now, this leads to the first missionary journey, which is the, the goal is really Gal what we would call Galatia, if you will, or, or Asia Minor. Uh, uh, so, Salam, these are the different cities. Let's take a look at the map. Um, Saul and Barnabas set out together from Antioch, uh, and they're joined by a young man, young John Mark. Rich kid, probably a little spoiled. Uh, there's all kinds of speculation that he might have been the rich young man that fled naked in the garden that night and so forth. He's, anyway, for whatever, uh, they uh, go to Cyprus. They encounter a character by the name of Bargesus who is a false prophet but a friend of the governor. He's struck blind. The governor thus becomes a believer and some other things occur. But um, then they head to uh, Italia. Uh, at this, it's at this point from Paphos on that Saul be call, starts calling himself Paul. He changes his name from Saul to Paul. And uh, it's also about this time that John Mark is not excited about getting up in Galatia. It's apparently a very rough country. And he fades on them and goes back to Jerusalem. Something that really upsets Paul later. He gets into a big debate with Barnabas over this. And uh, Paul preaches to both Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews are very jealous. They get very upset and they stir up opposition. They stay quite a while. Many Jews and Gentiles become believers. But a Gentile plot against their lives forces them uh, to move on. At Lystra, Paul uh, heals a cripple. They're, they are hailed as gods that people want to worship them. Enemies arrive from Antioch and Iconium, and they're almost killed there. And uh, they flee to Derby, and many more disciples are won, and so forth. Several times here, Paul several, will be left for dead. Um, and uh, uh, whether he actually died or whether he rose from the dead is a debate among some scholars. But in any case, uh, there's a lot of adventures here. And so um, they return back home the way they came, revisiting the churches they planted, encouraging the, these young churches. And they finally report all, they give the final report uh, to the church in Antioch. Now this leads to Acts 15. This is a chapter that's very, very important. We obviously can't recount all the little details, you can just read them, but once you understand Acts 15, a huge controversy has erupted within the church. 
over what obligations are incumbent upon Gentile believers. You need to understand the situation. Before Christ, if you wanted to join the, 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 uh, the, the Israel in their worship, you became a pr- proselyte. You would, become, you, would, you would take on the obligations of becoming a Jew. You'd get circumcised and, and, and adopt uh, all the legal requirements. The Jewish church, the, the, all the believers, the apostles, everyone, they were all Jewish. And they took for granted that if you wanted to join the church, great, you became a Jew. And uh, they assumed you'd get circumcised and you'd have to get Mosaic law. And uh, a big, uh, others said, no, they're still Gentiles. They're saved, but they're Gentiles. So a big controversy to, uh, erupted here. Do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to keep the Mosaic laws and so forth? Paul and Barnabas and Peter and others came down to Jerusalem to get this whole thing resolved because by now it had become a big dispute. And uh, they, 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 re- they, they give the report about uh, how they've gone to these places and people accept Christ and the Holy Spirit gets poured out, people get healed. They don't become Jewish. That's, not, that, that, that's, that's the, the, the argument. Peter is also there and he testifies. And I want you to uh, notice, I love the way Peter puts this in Acts 15. This is Peter speaking. He says, Now therefore, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He's saying, you know, in other words, why make these Gentiles take on all the burdens of, of the Jewish laws? Now why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, meaning the believers, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. (laughs) You get the inversion? (laughs) He's not saying these guys can be saved just like we are. He's saying we might be as saved as they are. (laughs) Because he's he's doing that in the context of these miracles that they're observing as they go through in these foreign countries where people accept the Lord, they get the Holy Spirit, and and, and all kinds of miraculous things happen. So that's that's what he's arguing. But what most people who study this chapter miss is there are two issues here. The main issue that everybody focuses on is, gee, does a uh, believer have to become a Jew to be saved? And the answer, of course, no. But there's another problem. What must a Gentile do to be saved? He's going to answer that, of course. But the other question is, what's to become of Israel? See, the implied question, the other flip side of that question is, if a believer, a Gentile, becomes, uh, does not have to become a Jew to be saved, what was this all for? All of our history, all of these laws, all of these ordinances, the priesthood, uh, all the, you know, the temple. Is this all now over? Is it gone? That's, that's their issue. And James a- answers, uh, James is clear to the leader of the church in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. He says, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, quote, and he's now quoting, it happens from Amos chapter 9. He says, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. And he goes on. In other words, God is going to call out a people for his name out of the Gentiles. And once that's done, he will then return and build the tabernacle and do all these other things. Do you follow me? So the point, what the main point here is, well, two points. That a believer does not have to become a Jew to become a, a Gentile does not have to become a Jew to be in Christ. He's grafted in by the very fact that he's in Christ. But uh, the second thing is, is that God is not through with Israel. Israel has a destiny after the church is complete. And that's what it's emphasizing. Very important point that most churches today miss. Do your own study, come to your own conclusions. The resolution that James publishes, the Gentiles should abstain from idols, abstain from fornication, and abstain from things strangled in blood. There, you know, that's a hygienic thing. You, you know, say, other than that, fine. There's no comment here about circumcision. There's no comment here about keeping the Sabbath. That doesn't mean those aren't good things to do. It means they're not required. See, that's the point. There's a big difference. There's no commitment to there's no, the, the ceremonial laws are, are, are not laid on them for that. The other issue here is the, that of Israel's identity, and we're going to take that up in the next session, because the book of Romans spends three chapters hammering on that one for us. We'll we get to the second missionary journey after the Council of Jerusalem, in which they go to Greece, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus, and so forth. 
And so Paul and Barnabas argue about taking Mark along. Mark wants to come along, and, and Paul wants no part of it because he quit on them before. So Barnabas, they, they, Paul, this causes Paul and Barnabas to split up. God usually uses their tension to double their efforts because Barnabas takes Mark and they go their way, and Paul takes Silas and they go their way. So they got now two teams out rather than just one team, see? So Barnabas takes Paul uh, with him to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas to Galatia. And uh, at Lystra, Paul encounters a young guy, Timothy, to join them. He becomes one of his protégés. And his couple of letters to Timothy are, pre- are treasures for us to this day. But understand there's another Antioch they encounter up there in Galatia. Antioch of Pisidia, some people would call it. But uh, 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 don't confuse the two Antioch. The key one is the one in Syria, the first one we mentioned. And anyway, they, as they go through now, they publish the, de- the decisions of the Jerusalem Council that a Gentile can join the church by accepting Christ. He does not have to be circumcised or become a Jew to do so. And then Paul, Paul goes to Bithynia, which is up north, um, northern part of Turkey, almost to that area that's starting to get into Magog, if you will. And he's blocked by the Holy Spirit. He wants to go there very badly, but the Holy Spirit makes it quite clear that uh, that ain't where he wants you. And I might mention something here as you read the book of Acts, you encounter these resistances and so forth, but Luke is editorializing for you. The Holy Spirit won't let him go. Realize that's, that's glibly said, but it's an inference they have to draw from having encountered certain kinds of resistance and so forth. But it's at this time that Paul has a night vision. In this night vision, in a dream, there's a Macedonian that shows up and urges him to come across. See, Macedonia is across the the, the sea to Greece. He said, come on over and see, on the one hand, Paul can't go north, the Holy Spirit won't let him, but he is called to go um, uh, west to Greece by the Macedonian dream. And, and uh, so at, at Troas. And so it's also at this point, by the way, that we discover Luke joins them. This is where he first shows up in the picture. And they sail then for Macedonia, or what we might consider northern Greece. And uh, there are many scholars that suspect that Luke was the guy in the dream. <laughs> okay, it was a, it was a prophecy of, of, of encountering Luke, but whatever. In any case, that takes them to Philippi. And uh, there there's a, a, there's a girl that's a, has, that's a medium that has an evil spirit. She gets, uh, becomes a believer. When she becomes a believer, she loses her occultic gift. That's very interesting. Her owners are really teed off because that was a source of income. So they protest. There's a big crowd and there's a bruja that goes on. And uh, they get flogged and imprisoned, but they're freed by an earthquake. The jailer is really panicked. He's going to kill himself because he would inherit the, all the liabilities that are thus unfinished if these do escape. But he gets converted by Paul. Very, very inter- interesting. The Philippi- Philippian jailer is an interesting episode there. They travel to Thessalonica, a little further uh, 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 westward. And uh, so Paul convinces both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, so the, Jews, some, the Jewish establishment in the region stirs up a riot against it. And Paul leaves secretly. He has to get out of town. So he slips out of Thessalonica and heads to Berea. And this is chapter, uh, uh, chapter 17. They get a little better reception there, but there's still a mob that gets stirred up by Jews from Thessalonica, and there's still problems. But one of the, there's a verse that's become a, our, our, one of our trademarks in this ministry. Because uh, Luke tells us that the people in Berea were more, they had riots in both places, they had people accepted in both places, they had riots in both places. But he says, the ones in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word of God with all openness of mind, but they searched the Scriptures daily to prove where those things would be so. We might say they came, they're came. they from Missouri. In other words, they were open but still skeptical. And that's healthy. That's what Paul says. They're more noble than those that's like. In that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, yet searched the Scriptures daily to prove where those things would be so. The way I usually paraphrase that, that's where Luke tells you don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. But do your own diligence. Receive with all openness of mind, but search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And we've used that as a trademark on our institute and other things, so for what it's worth. Okay, well Paul leaves for Athens. He leaves Silas and Timothy behind to, uh, to follow up on the work, and he get, goes to Athens. And this is where we have the famous, in Acts 17, the, the uh, famous speech he makes on Mars Hill, at the Ropicus, or at Mars Hill, if you will. Um, 
And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Areopagus was the court of the judges, if you will. It, it was crowned by the Parthenon. If you go there to visit, there's temples, theaters, marketplace, the Agora, and all of that. Uh, Areopagus was where Socrates, some four centuries earlier, Socrates was tried and put to death. Um, uh, this is where Paul makes his famous speech. And it's interesting how Paul preaches. He's not preaching to Jews here. He's preaching to Greeks. So he's not speaking from the Old Testament. He's not quoting the Scriptures. He's quoting Greek poets. First of all, he starts where their heart is. So you have to understand they were idolaters. Do you know how many gods they had there in Athens? 30,000 is estimated by some scholars. They had all kinds of things. And he notices, so he gives them a compliment. He says, you're obviously extremely devout. You're very God-fearing. Look at all the gods you've got. He, gives, he doesn't turn that against them. He says, you're obviously very God-fearing. But as he's going through this, he says, I found one a, a idol committed to the unknown God. That's the guy I want to talk to you about, the one you don't know. <laughs> you see? And do you see the, the genius here that's going on? And he goes on, he says, we are his offspring. He's not quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from an astronomical poem by Aratus. That was a Greek countryman of Paul, from Tarsus that is, a predecessor three centuries earlier. He also quotes from a religious hymn of Cleanthes of Troas, who was a contemporary of Aratus. So these are two ancient Greek poets that would be venerated by his audience. And he quotes from them to give them a place to start. And so that's where the, whole, the famous speech at Mars Hill is. And uh, he also in another place, by the way, quotes from yet a third Greek poet, Menander, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But in any case, so uh, not a, it's a very famous speech. Not a lot is accomplished. They just agreed to talk more about it later. He departs from Athens to Corinth, which is very close, of course, but not very far away. Silas and Timothy bring news from Thessalonica. And as a result, Paul writes the Thessalonian letters. And he'll spend about two years here despite the Jewish opposition. These Thessalonian letters are the two earliest, we think, the earliest epistles. They're so important that we're going to defer dealing with them until we get to hour 21, which is going to be our review of eschatology. But the fir- it's interesting that both of these letters that he writes to the Thessalonians review what he taught them when he was there. He was there for a few weeks. He's now been gone two years. But when he writes letters to them, he simply reminds them of things he taught them while he was there for a few weeks. The first letter emphasizes the rapture. They're all concerned, and he explains again how the rapture works. So it's very, very important to understand the first Thessalonian letter. Later on, they again get concerned about eschatology. They're all worried about the fact that uh, the, pers- the tri- tribulation seems to have started, and they're still here. They apparently were taught that they would not see the great tribulation. Doesn't mean they wouldn't have persecution. There's a difference. Anyway, Paul clarifies that in the second letter. So the two letters, interestingly enough, deal with eschatology. What's really bizarre is these, ex- these are considered very advanced topics in modern Bible studies. But what's fascinating to me is Paul taught them these issues in the first few weeks of their Christian experience. It's two years later, he writes them letters, and in the letters, he reminds them of that which he taught them when he was with them, which means he exposed them to these ideas right up front, which I think is very fascinating. But anyway, the Thessalonian letters. So he writes from Corinth back to Thessalonians, and we'll, we'll study those in depth uh, in a subsequent session. And, uh, and then uh, they sail from here um, to Ephesus, and uh, they wanted, when he got to Ephesus, they wanted him to stay longer, but he resists that. And uh, they travel back to Antioch uh, uh, via, they go to Caesarea in Jerusalem first, but then they get back to their home church, which is Antioch in effect. They stop by Jerusalem to report, but they, they really, their, their real base of operations is Antioch. So that's the second. The third missionary journey, uh, they finally uh, decide to revisit the churches in Galatia and, and uh you know, where they were on the first uh, uh, journey. And uh, after they do revisit those churches, he makes Ephesus his base there for three years. And uh, Apollos shows up about this time. Disciples of Apollos receive the Holy Spirit. A church is founded, and there's more adventures. There are some problems in Corinthians that cause a lot of confusion. Paul, while in Ephesus, uh, plans to go to Macedonia. He sends Timothy and Erastus instead. 
Uh, they may go on to visit Cor Corinth, but Paul is very worried about the immorality in the church there in Corinth. To be a Corinthian, as we'll start, we'll get into when we get to Corinthian later. But to be a Corinthian was uh, uh, was equivalent to calling a person a fornicator. Uh, it was analogous to what we think of as Hollywood today, or something. Um, and Paul is very worried about the church there because about immorality. And so, uh, three members of the church, Corinthian church bring a letter to Paul, and it's full of questions, and the problems apparently are far greater than Paul had even realized. And so he, he writes a letter in response to this visit back to, first, to, to, to Corinth. We call that letter 1 Corinthians. And he tackles these problems, okay? Well, Paul hurries to Corinth. And when he gets there, the encounter there is apparently very painful for everyone. Paul has to be very severe. And uh, he returns then back to Ephesus and writes a second letter that we don't apparently have. It, don't, call it, don't think it's 2 Corinthians. It's, it, we'll just call it the severe letter. And Titus takes this letter to Corinth, and Paul arranges to, to meet Titus up in Troas uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to get how the situation is going. And uh, so Paul is at the center of a riot in Ephesus. His messages there in Ephesus have threatened the silver trade. There are a bunch of guilds that made their money off selling um, uh, religious artifact, and they're uh, celebrating the, the, the Ephesian goddess Diana. And uh, so uh, that trade is dropping off because of Paul's preaching, so there's a big riot. And uh, but anyway, he, he um, goes up to Thro uh, Troas, and he, Paul's really worried about this last letter, this painful letter. Was it too harsh? Titus is not where he was supposed to be. He somehow, they, they, they didn't appear as arranged. So he goes to Macedonia in search of Titus. I have no idea how they would arrange to meet, but somehow through the network stuff, they would meet to arrange. And, and uh, meanwhile, he's on the way, he's encouraging churches, and he's collecting money for the church in Jerusalem. Finally, Paul and Titus meet, and Paul gets good news. The severe letter was taken as Paul had intended. It did not result in the misunderstandings that Paul was fearful of. So he writes what we call 2 Corinthians. It's really, you might call 3 Corinthians, if you recognize there's one that we've, we've lost. Some people feel segment that, that the 2 Corinthians is actually a composite of several letters, and the, the, the missing letter may be part of it, tucked in there. There's a the scholastic debate about that. But in any case, Paul writes 2 Corinthians, it, which is full of joy. Many people, it's their favorite epistle, because it's a joyful epistle. And Titus takes the letter to prepare the church for Paul's visit. And so that's the, what letter we call 2 Corinthians, written um, uh, uh, in response to Paul's anxiety, you know, hearing the good news. He stays in Achaia for about three months, probably in Corinth, or at least in that region. And there he writes the, the letter to the Romans, the most comprehensive statement of Christian doctrine in the Bible. And uh, he plans to travel to Jerusalem by sea, However, a plot by his enemies forces him to return through Macedonia. So he changes plans to, to, in response to that threat and persecution. So he arrives at Philippi and at Troy's. He preaches till midnight. There's one guy sitting in the window that falls asleep. And it's a third story window. So he fell and, and, and apparently died. And, uh, uh, but he's raised from the dead. I want you to notice that he was uh, preaching for about six hours. So those of you that are a little restless after 60 or 90 minutes... Uh, Okay. Um, anyway, Miletus. Now, Paul wants to talk to the elders at Ephesus. He seems to know that this is the end, the last time he'll see them, because he knows what's, there's some tough adventures coming. But he doesn't go to Ephesus. He goes to Miletus, which is on the opposite side of a peninsula. The elders cross the peninsula to come meet him. He's doing that to avoid the crowds. He wants to give his farewell to the elders there. So he bids farewell to the Ephesian elders. We're going to talk more about that when we get to the book of Revelation because we're going to explore the nuances there when Jesus Christ writes a letter to Ephesus and show how those fit together. So we'll deal with that then. But it's a very touching letter of affection and also warnings of the future at Miletus it's to the Ephesian elders. And, and, and then he goes from there back to uh, Tyre and back to, uh, to, to home base. And so, after lighting a tire, they spend a day at uh, Ptolemaeus, and then up to uh, at Caesarea, they stay at Philip's house. 
Agabus the prophet dramatizes to Paul. He takes Paul's belt and ties himself up and shows this is what's going to happen to you, if you when you get down to Jerusalem. Paul is undeterred. He's going to go to Jerusalem despite these prophetic warnings. And uh, when he gets to Jerusalem, of course, he's welcomed by the church, fortunately. But he's recognized by some adversary Jews from Asia, and a mob tries to kill him. There's 40 guys that swear a blood oath to, to, uh, to kill him. Uh, they don't do that. I don't know whatever happened to them because the Roman troops rescue Paul from all of that. Uh, he does get permission to make a speech, but that just incites more violence. So Paul announces his Roman citizenship. That shakes up the Romans a bit to realize he's a born, he's got Roman citizenship. That's un- very unusual. And uh, uh, he, he made a defense before the Jerusalem council that turns violent. So the violence comes from the Jewish leadership. Understand that. The Roman troops are arresting him, but they're doing that to protect him. And uh, so he, anyway, uh, the, the Romans learn about this plot against his life, and so he's sent under armed guard to Caesarea, which is the headquarters. That's where Governor Felix is in residence. So Paul has a number of hearings before the Sanhedrin, which turned violent. He has a hearing before Governor Felix, who defers, and he's still in prison for two years until Festus replaces Felix. Festus receives him. But by this time, Paul is getting the message. He spent several years in prison while they were waiting to figure out what to do. They don't know what to do with him. They, um, from an administrative point of view, they just want peace. But here's this guy, wherever he goes, there's all this uproar. So they're not they're quite sure what to do. So before Festus, Paul says, okay, I, he, he plays his trump card. I appeal to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. He has that right. That also means, by the way, a written record of all the background has to precede him to Rome. And that's what Luke's all about, we think. He was fu- funded by, he got someone to fund him, Theophilus, and the t- that, that was all pulled together in support of Paul's hearing. But in any case, uh, he's, uh, he's still in prison while this gets all resolved, and he, now he's before King Agrippa, and Agrippa's kind of impressed with him. But uh, he can't do anything now because Paul has put it out of his hands. He's put it to, to, to Caesar. That's, where, that's, Christ, that's what... Uh, Christ's destiny is to get Paul to Rome for lots of reasons. Well, we have this very interesting chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 27, where they leave from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and then up Caesarea they go to Sidon, and uh, the, uh, Paul and other prisoners pick up a ship of Sidon late in the season. This is in October, so it's, it's, it's getting uh, uh, too late to safely navigate these waters. Uh, there are very a lot of storms at this time, and uh, so they pick up a, 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 a granary, a huge ship, a grain ship, heading for Rome. It's a, it, that's the way they supplied the food to Rome. Um, at Myra, they pick up this granary. And uh, they get to a place, they, they're tacking, and they get to a place called Fairhaven, which is a shelter from bad weather. Um, they hope it's just a little bit further, they'd like to go to Phoenice, because they believe that would be a better harbor to weather the winter in. But uh, they have a meeting. The centurion that's aboard, that's the military commander, the o- ship owner, ship uh, uh, captain, and Paul. Paul's quite a seasoned, uh, experienced guy at this point. Luke, by the way, is along with him, probably as a slave. It's the only way he would be able to accompany Paul as a prisoner. But he's a, Luke's along as his slave or uh, as doctor. Um, but in any case, uh, Paul tries to advise him to stay at Fairhaven, not go further. But they ignore him. What does he know? <laughs> and uh, so... They decide to try to make it to Phoenix, but a huge storm shifts, and uh, they get near the little island Clota, but they, are, they suddenly find themselves in desperate straits. And um, they, the storm blows them. They're fearful of getting to the, 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 the desert area here. If they, if, they, if they should land on the northern part of Africa, in that, in that area there, there's no water for many, many miles. It's, it's, a, it's a, a commitment to death, in effect. And so, but anyway, in, in this storm, they ultimately end up, um, uh, uh, after two weeks they, uh, uh, of storm, they jettison all their cargo and gear, they stave, uh, stave off a mutiny, and along the way, Paul ends up winning the respect and the admiration of the, of the, of the uh, centurion and uh, the tribunal. He, uh, uh, he's, he, he uh, takes a liking to Paul. In fact, saves, saves, he saves their life, and, he, and the centurion saves his. But they reach this sandbar in which the ship's going to break up on, and uh, they, uh, there's an incident where they drop four anchors. They, 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 they have anchors to keep the, the ship from 
crashing, and then they finally cut the anchors, head in, and uh, swim to shore. No lives were lost. All this was predicted by an angel to Paul, and he mentions that if, if they follow his directions, which they do. And in effect, uh, it's quite a dramatic event. Now, the reason I'm touching on this, in Acts 27, there's so much mar- uh, uh, marine detail that it was recently possible by looking at that very carefully to track down the four anchors of Paul. They're exactly where the Bible says they would be. And uh, we just got back from a cruise a few months ago where they were formally delivered to the museum at Malta. And uh, so that, that's, uh, there's a, uh, we have briefing packs on that. Bob Cornuke was very instrumental in having this all pulled together, has written some very uh, graphic books on this. It's very worth your reading. I commend them to your background. But in any case, uh, while they're on Malta, they survive a venomous snake and uh, they heal the uh, uh, chief of the island of a fever. And after three months, they sail to Syracuse, and after three days at Regium, and then on to Petoli, which is a major harbor. And uh, he's, Paul's very encouraged by the local believers. He's kept under house arrest awaiting trial. For two years, he's under house arrest, in effect, uh, in Rome, and he enjoys considerable freedom to, to, to preach. The last we hear of Paul, of course, are through his his pastoral letters. His first, uh, his, uh, there are three books that in the Old Testament, I mean, the, excuse me, in the New Testament, that they give us uh, uh, glimpses of what happened after the book of Acts. Uh, they're written to two of his young protégés. Uh, first Timothy, Paul is out of prison by this time, probably released from his house arrest at Rome and uh, at the end of Acts. He'd recently been in Ephesus and heading for Macedonia. He left Timothy in Ephesus to continue his work, and he's giving him counsel, and that letter is very worth reading. Titus was Paul's troubleshooter. When there was a trouble in church that Paul couldn't deal with, he dispatched Titus on a number of occasions. And uh, he apparently traveled uh, to Crete with uh, Titus, and uh, he knows the situation there very well, so he may have been on Crete for some time. He left Titus there to, and uh, asked him to uh, meet him at Nicopolis, and uh, we, we intended to spend the winter and so forth. And uh, so... Uh, 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 Titus is, as I say, one of his troubleshooters. And uh, then his last letter of all, he wrote to Timothy. Now this situation, Paul is in prison, probably facing death, and it's Paul that is encouraging Timothy. You'd think it'd be the other way around. And he seems to expect execution pretty soon, Uh, but he had been traveling recently. He left his cloak and some books at Troas, apparently, and uh, he'd been at Miletus and Corinth, uh, leaving friends in all those places. And, uh, and there's a hint that he may have also been at Ephesus. Anyway, this does seem to be Paul's last letter. There's also some hints here and there that he may have visited Spain. He had intentions to do so, and some scholars believe that he, uh, he may have done so after his few was arrested. So he was arrested, released, had some freedom, and then was arrested again, and then killed. And so um, there's a tradition that he did visit Spain. So, so much. The book of Acts, let's just wrap it up. The birth of the church is the key issue, as distinct from Israel. Study those topics very carefully. The book of Acts is the gateway to the epistles. We've been to the historical books. Now we're going to get into the interpretation and significance of all these things. The history of the first 30 years of the church is outlined in the book of Acts. The next 2,000 are also in the Bible in the, in the, in the form of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which we'll deal with in a special session when we get there. Just as the period between the two testaments is not absent from your Bible, it's anticipated in Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 35. Likewise, the history of the church, after the first 30 years as covered by the book of Acts, is anticipated in the seven letters that Jesus uh, profiles for us in uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So our next session will be on the Epistle of the Romans. The definitive gospel according to Paul, the most comprehensive book in the New Testament, its impact, the impact of the book of Romans is unequaled in all of history. See, grace always erodes to forms of legalism. And when grace finally becomes obscured, you know what that leads to? The Dark Ages, from the 6th through the 16th century, dark period. What got us out of the dark period was the rediscovery, if you will, of God's grace through the book of Romans. If you really want us the history of the church, you should uh, either get our briefing pack called The Kingdom of Blood that Dave Hunt and I did together, or better yet, just go get Dave's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, which gives you both a historical and a uh, prophetic glimpse of, of the, the, what I'll call the medieval church. And uh, so uh, that'll be next time.